We are here to bring you everything and anything surrounding Porsche. I'm Mike. I'm Aaron. And this is P Car Talk. All right. Thank you for joining us for another episode of P Car Talk. I'm Mike. And I'm Aaron. Got a fun filled, packed episode for you guys today. Got a ton of stuff to go over. Gonna go ahead and address the monkey in the room. Obviously, we had some sound issues last time. Uh, we are well aware of it. Um, we're addressing it. You know, like I said, we're only 10, 11 episodes in, so we're still perfecting that. So we appreciate everybody's patience. We actually appreciate everybody's feedback on that. Let's give the sound guy a mulligan on that one, and uh, let's just go ahead and move forward so we don't have to beat a dead horse on that one, huh, Aaron? Yeah, poor sound guy. <laughs> um, and before we get started with the episode, just kind of want to say thank you so, so, so much for all of our listeners across the world. This is kind of a global thing. Um, we're all over the place and we kind of pulled it a little bit of data and it's pretty surprising. We're in the Ukraine, South Africa, Switzerland, Netherlands, Norway, Australia, Canada, Great Britain, and of course the good old, uh, USA. So thank you guys so much. Um, if we didn't call your country out, maybe you should get on there, subscribe, right? <laughs> yep, that's, that's how that works. <laughs> so yeah, get on there, subscribe, maybe write a review. Uh, everyone that I did give a shout out to, thank you guys so, so much. It's we never thought we'd ever have that kind of reach already. But yeah, one person, I would have been happy. I've yeah. been it's, it's starting to grow. Pretty wild. And uh, again, thank you guys so much for the support. And we love you guys so much. And you just keep on doing uh, what you're doing. And we'll keep on doing what we're doing and try to make it better every time. But um, enough of that. Let's get into this episode. What are we, uh, we going to go over today, Aaron? Oh, we got we got a few things on the at least the news front. So we got some Brexit talk. Some Ooh. diesel gate is what I'm calling it. And then uh, some world records trying to be set. Nice. Because Brexit talk, that's just, ugh. Isn't that like a stab in the heart when you hear stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, everybody has their opinion on what they should do. Yeah, I mean, exactly right. Yeah. Good if they do, bad if they don't. It's, it's all, those, all those things. Living in the UK, you get the big punch in the nuts on that one. Yeah, if you're a Porsche guy in the UK, it's not. It, it might be a little worse. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, for example, so what they were talking about, it's just, it's not law or it's all speculation, I think, so far from what I was reading, that everybody that buying something new might get a little extra tax, like, nah, like the UK is not used to that already. Yeah, exactly. They're getting hammered on everything as we, as, as everything happens anyway. So why not just throw this on them too, right? Yeah. So it's going to be a 10% surcharge. Oh, God. So like, for example, it's like 119, our money, US money to, uh. 131 for the base yeah and that's gonna and they're afraid that's i mean it's gonna work its way up and and possibly go through other luxury lines as well it's not gonna be just porsche but that's that's what it's looking like for yeah because porsche is just trying to be transparent right with its customer base is saying hey this might this might be coming to you guys and sorry about the kick in the dick we're not we're not actually responsible for this but you know it's your country exactly they're just trying to give you a little heads up oh man yeah, but the, I mean, like I said, the the implication that there might apply to the whole range, Volkswagen and everything, that it's going to be... For UK. such a small island, they are brutal to their people, aren't they, man? Good Lord. Yeah, well, <laughs> there's other options, I guess. Yeah, yeah, right. Talking to you, Rob, you might, you might need to move out of there and move on. <laughs> yeah, come on, come over to Florida. Yeah, you seem to like it here. Yeah, so uh, moving on to the diesel gate. So we all know Volkswagen had their little their little uh oopsie with the with the the diesel may not be exactly what they were talking about mm-hmm. as far as power numbers and emissions goes and and all that it was kind of holding back it looks like porsche might get wrangled in as well really yeah um because their stance was that porsche was okay yeah. and good with it through their models and that there was nothing wrong they weren't they weren't harming anything okay they weren't there was no fault with them hmm. like volkswagen but it seems like from a few articles that they're still getting wrangled in and, and they might get, you know, I, I'm kind of not, I'm not surprised by that because I heard, you know, back when that diesel gate thing happened with VW, you know, Mercedes was, there were, people were pointing fingers all over the place. They're like, well, they're doing the same things we're doing. And yet maybe because of the power of Mercedes Benz, that kind of went away. Maybe certain people were paid for that to just, Hey, don't drag us into this, this, we do our own thing. But, um, there's a lot of shared technology there, though, right? So, I mean, across the board, we all know that it's family. So, it would it would seem very reasonable mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. that it may be the case that it, that it's it's moved on. It, it could be possible for Porsche to have an issue as well. Yeah, but I mean, they're looking at the. It looks like the suit is totaling about a billion dollars. Oh my god! So this is just going to reiterate why diesel is going to go away and everybody's going to go electric. I'm sure because everybody was kind of trying to sneak around the diesel, even though it gets outstanding gas mileage, they couldn't find a way for it to be eco-friendly, right? Well, yeah, and as stringent as their laws are in place anyways. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that may, it makes sense. I mean, who's thinking about the future, man? Like, let's just get good gas mileage now, right? Exactly. Let's just <laughs> diesel electric. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot more stuff that's going on, man. How about all these, like, monster, you know, equipment that's on the roadside that's building all this stuff. I see them pumping tons of diesel out of their things. I don't know. Those things probably don't even have mufflers on them. <laughs> They're probably zero emission level worried about that at all. No, exactly. None. Yeah, yeah. Those guys don't pollute at all, right? Not, not at all. That, the black smoke's a good thing. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I have mixed feelings about that kind of stuff. I mean, even when Volkswagen got like trounced through the mud, it's, they're so strangled as far as what they have to do as a company saying, okay, well, you have to meet these standards. You have to do this. You have to do that. And it's, okay, well, we still need to make a car and you guys want us to make them efficient. You want us to do that. I just, I think it's not trying to stand by what they did, whether it was wrong or right. But I guess from a a challenging standpoint, how are they supposed to make something nowadays? Very, very carefully, I guess. I mean, they have to follow those letter of the laws. and And I don't know that we're more strict on our emissions than Germany is. Yeah, I would imagine they're way more strict over there than we are. I mean, they do. I mean, they're required to get their tube and stuff. Yeah. You could live in Florida where there's just nothing and you could just, it's the wild west. I mean. Cowboy it up. Yeah. I mean, you got a fender. It doesn't go on the car. No problem. Don't worry about it. You can drive without a fender. Not needed. Yeah. Just keep on rolling. They don't care. But yeah, it's, it's kind of a shame, but what are you going to do? I mean, when it's out of our control, it's almost kind of like this bigger picture was already set in place. And um, they strategically started backing these companies into corners where they're like, look, electric's coming, whether you like it or not. You know, it might be a 20-year plan or 30-year plan, but this is going to happen. You guys are going to get on board. Yeah, but everybody that was back in the electric company is like, I got a lawyer here and there, and I think we can mm-hmm. pile this on and make it happen. Talking about that diesel gate a little bit more, did you ever see that dirty money thing that they did on VW about how they actually uncovered how all that happened and all that stuff? I mean, it's been a while. I did. I do think I saw some of it, but I, I'm not too. I don't remember too much of it. Yeah, I, I just, I'm not like a shady guy by any means. But kudos to uh, Volkswagen for taking the extra length of trying to hide as much as possible. Like they set it up to like this. The short story of it was, you know, they 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 would dyno these cars and they would do all these things and it wouldn't pump out the diesel and it was doing it was passing everything, but they couldn't figure out how they were doing it. Because it would run a, basically a, a dual system on the computer. Like it'd run one computer, you know, tune essentially. And the minute the wheel turned, it would run another tune. Well, it took the EPA a long time to figure out the wheel had to turn to run the other tune. And it kind of happened as an accident. So they were had it on the dyno. They had it running and it wasn't doing anything. And I guess one of the guys bumped the steering wheel with his leg or something. And it spiked off the charts and they were like, what did you just do? And he's like, I didn't do anything. And they're like, you had to have done something. Let's retrace the steps. Bump the steering wheel. It turned the steering wheel. Basically that engaged the second tune, which was the dump everything in the atmosphere tune. And that's how they uncovered what Volkswagen had done to be sneaky about it. And it, it's a kind of a shame because these cars, obviously they were still great cars. They got great gas mileage, but I mean, everybody who bought the cars, you know, they were advertising, false advertising with a clean diesel. Yep. I mean, it was diesel, just not clean. Exactly. You know, maybe if they would have just been like, look, man, this thing really pollutes, but it gets outstanding gas mileage. If they'd have been a little transparent, maybe people wouldn't have been so up in arms about it. But it's, Yeah, but I mean, you got to have that. You want that performance and that speed. Yeah. It was just kind of interesting. If you guys hadn't seen it, get on there. I think it's on, I saw it on uh, Netflix, but um, that's a free plug for those guys. They didn't pay us or anything for that one. But uh <laughs> Go ahead and check it out. It's actually pretty interesting if you're into any of that, you know, background of how maybe somebody got th- got away with something or did anything like that. But um, it's it's it was rather interesting. What else we have, Aaron? Also, bringing out that uh, speed and performance. So the world record breaking uh, driver, his name is, well, he's not yeah, but he's he's going to. He's done a, I guess he's done motorcycle records. He holds one. His name is Zef Einsberg. 
and he's working with the, the Mad Max race team. They're taking a Turbo S, and their goal is to hit 320 kilometers. Wow. What does that translate to in mile per hour? Fast. Fast. <laughs> Almost over, 200, right? Over, over, over 200? I think it's overdue. Okay. And I think he's doing this. This is actually happening in, in um, the UK. Yep, it's in, it's in the South, South Wales area. Okay, so it's kind of probably like the Bonneville Salt Flats type of area where land speed records get set. So I think he's, he's going to set the record. I think sometime in April he's going to give it a shot and try to, do, try to break that record then with the Turbo S. I just, we brought that up because obviously it's a Porsche, so we want, I thought that was interesting. That was their choice of car to do that with. He's already set a record with the Hibusa at 324 kilometers per Ooh. hour. Wow. So, I mean, with doors, it's got to be easier. Yeah, right? You would assume so. But, I mean, how does that work? I mean, I've never been on the Bonneville Salt Flats or anything like that, so I'm sure you have to take into consideration if you're on some type of sandy surface or, like, what type of surface you're racing on of the friction and what that might cause and what that's going to do to the vehicle. And Yeah, I mean, every move that you make is going to be exponentially scaled mm-hmm. versus, I mean, just normally driving. Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, not to shy on his, what he's doing, that sounds great, but I mean, I guess from a speed standpoint, I mean, maybe if we're, I'm so jaded because all these numbers and I hear all these things about these cars going a certain speed, and maybe I'm because I'm thinking about pavement, but I'm like, 200 something miles an hour in a Turbo S doesn't really seem like you're blowing the doors off something if it's tuned and you're doing stuff to it. I mean, I, I'm sure that car could probably do 200 relatively easily couldn't it oh yeah but the uh so i looked it up i mean that's uh it's 198 so it's not okay. even 200 so i wonder this must be some weird world speed record because i'm sure that there's i mean there has to be a thing I mean, yeah it's probably it it's probably because it's location specific there isn't a lot of info out there guys on it that's why we're not we're not just trying to guess but like we tried to read up on it and there isn't a whole lot about it out there but from what we can see is it's it has to be, it's kind of a sandy type of, it says, it's called at what? Uh, Pepdine Pen, Sounds. Pendine Sands. Pendine Sands in South Wales. So I'm assuming it's a sandy area, probably a beached area. He may be, you know what it could be too? It, it could be a, a distance thing where there's not that much area to do it. And maybe it's two miles he has to do it in. And maybe that's why it's going to be a, a record as opposed to like Bonneville. I mean, what is it wide open? You have like 30 miles to try to get up to speed or something like that. Yeah. But then you have to do it twice though. You have to do it there and back for Bonneville. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, the, I'm just talking like geographically, there's a lot more land area to do it with. Maybe this, he's doing it in a very short amount of runway. If you, if so to speak, you know, land area to do it on, but it sounds pretty interesting. Uh, Best of luck to those guys out there, and hopefully, you know, everything goes smoothly. Obviously, at that kind of speed, anything can happen. Yep. I mean, it's still quick. I mean, 198s, no. It's not a slouch. It's yeah, really- I mean, like I said, I, I, I hate to discredit what he's doing because it does sound like I'm doing that, and I guess I'm kind of jaded with speed and everything nowadays, but obviously, we're thinking about pavement, and we're thinking about long, straightaway roads here in the U.S., so who knows what this actual environment is that he's doing it on. I'm sure it's probably a, a beach type of atmosphere, I would imagine. And I would imagine that he probably only has so much area to do this in. Yeah, I mean, it, looked, it said something like racetrack, but I didn't name it unless that Pinvine Sands is a racetrack. It could be. And he's going for, since he only, I think he was going for the motorcycle record and the, mm-hmm. the car record. Yeah. And it just happens to be a 911 Turbo S. Yeah, it's a record nevertheless, right? Yeah. So, and he's doing it in a Porsche, so that, that's why it's news for us. Oh, for sure. Oh, that's interesting. So. Got some great stuff to talk about moving forward. Um, any any other interesting news you want to cover, Aaron? I don't think that's all I have, really. Okay. Yeah, I don't really have anything else that I can think of that's somewhat recent or anything like that. We've kind of went over. Um, but other than you know that 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 we have some stuff moving forward. We have a lot of a lot of traction actually with the show. It's been moving forward. And again, I just want to sh- say a big thank you to everybody who's who has been following us and who's been on the show and who's coming on the show in the future and shown a a lot of interest. I'll tell you what, the Porsche community has been wide open with open arms, you know, everywhere we've gone so far, you know, they love what we're doing and we were really thankful and grateful for that. 
Yeah, I mean, we haven't we haven't went a place we haven't made a friend. That's pretty much it. It keeps yeah. expanding in the network and knowing people, and it's it's crazy. Yeah, we never thought it'd already be here where it's at in such a short amount of time, and that's all thanks to the PCAR family out there, and we really owe that to you guys. Thanks, guys. Yeah. But um, so moving forward, some interesting news. I guess it's not news. I guess it's maybe retail, you know, if you've been paying attention to what's going on. But have you seen this 919 um, advertisement they've done where they've chop, they're chopping up the tires and they're making a record for it? Have you seen that? Yeah, I saw. I, I went through the article not too long ago. I, I didn't even know we we're talking about this, but it's, I've seen it pretty recent. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it's pretty interesting in this fact that they're they're going over this and they're talking about you know, okay, well, there's only four tires, so you can only make so much vinyl record from that, obviously, to begin with. And uh, their estimation behind it is they're making 200 records. And, and the skinny of it, and this is verbatim from Porsche, this isn't my words, they're making 200 records, and it's going to be 24 minutes of all of Porsche's wins at Le Mans in those records. But of those 200 records, nearly all of them have already been spoken for so there's only like 24 available to the public, which I find very interesting, that are going to go, and you can actually purchase them. They're going to be up at auction. Of course. Well, I mean, it's one, another one of those things where they want to keep their customers that are on the high end, I'm sure, got first choice. Absolutely. Or, or employees got first, probably employees first in yeah. the company, and then, hey, they know we're, you know we're doing this. Well, I mean, you think about it from a 200 standpoint. I mean. They're, they probably can name 200 top-end Porsche collectors slash race drivers of Le Mans. Like, yeah. They probably owe stuff to a lot of people, like, all, and, all, like you know, people that have driven and won Le Mans, and those guys are going to get those records. And it's just kind of an interesting thing that they've done. Um, another, I don't want to call it a ploy, because it sounds like a negative term when you say it that way, but it's an interesting thing that they did with that car as far as, the marketing team. Okay, let's let's chop these tires up and make them make them a record out of it. Yeah, I mean it's something you would never think of, and then it makes it. It's just another one of those things where it's it's a collectability level that's ultra limited. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that that alone, I mean, it's unbelievable how when you think Porsche is done doing something exclusive, they find another way to make something more exclusive. And I'm and I'm not complaining about it. I think it's pretty neat that they're doing it. So like one side of it's going to be able, like the side A you'll be able to listen to. And then the back side will actually feel like the slick that was running on the on the, the track basically. It'll be like a rough side, you know. Oh, well, that's cool. B. I didn't realize they were doing that. Yeah, so it's only going to be really one cool. side cuz it's only 24 minutes. So I guess I was re I guess I did read a little bit about that and I didn't I guess I wasn't putting that together in my head, but that's that's a really cool move. Yeah. So talking about that and talking about these things going to auction, let's talk about price here for a minute. Like, what do we think? And obviously, we don't have anything to base this on because none of them have been to auction. So we're just shooting in the dark at the minute. But like, I, I kind of want to just have this exercise with you for a minute because what do you think these are going to go for, the ones that can go at auction? Well, I mean, it's a multi-million dollar race car. Mm-hmm. It's Le Mans centered. And a winner. And a winner. So, I mean, it's a piece. I mean. So you're, a, ha- you're having a piece of the race car that won Le Mans if you get one of the 24. And then that's just amazing. That's a, that's a cool, that's a, just a G whiz cool thing to, hey, Mike, guess what I got. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, what do I think it would go for? I, I mean, we talking, you think hundreds of thousands of dollars? We talking maybe millions? I would, I, if it went millions, I would be shocked. I mean, I could see maybe a hundred grand. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, I guess, I guess it just depends who's at the auction, right? That's, like anything, yep. right? If there's, there's two, two people who want mm-hmm. it, it could be, it sky's the limit, you know, because we all know that there's very, very wealthy people in the Porsche world. This could go, you know, to who the wants moon. it? This could go to the moon. Who knows? I mean, you know, and then you're like, okay, well, this is one of 24 that was ever auctioned. Good luck getting one of the other ones that are basically locked away. And now there's one of 23, yeah. and there's one of 22. I mean, it, what I think was, they'll probably be a base. So obviously, obviously, there'll be one that sells. And then so then we have our bottom line. There's what they're going to go for. And it's going to go up from there. Yeah, like basically, I agree with that. They're going to set a precedence of like, okay, this is the baseline. This is where this one kind of went for. This is going to probably be standard asking price, and that's going to be the basis. But if that one goes, I don't know, let's just shoot a number. It's like $500,000 everybody's going to kind of know what it's going to take to buy one then. 
Yeah, I mean, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna make it even from something that's already special. It's gonna take it to the next level. Yeah, I think the type of guy or gal that I see buying something like this or have an opportunity at something like this is like the same guy who maybe has bought a flat at the Porsche Design Tower in Miami, right? Yep. I, would, I mean, and that's and what I would do is I would hang my 919 yeah. vinyl. Just, yeah. just never sell. I think that's, for me, I know that's very, very specific, but that's what I think of when I think of the, the buyer for this particular thing. And somebody that sold out to Porsche and it's yeah. just, it's... Yeah, They're all in it, right? It. I mean, if they yeah. have a house at Porsche Design Center in Miami, that in that place, I, I think they would be at that level where they have the kind of money, the kind of income to purchase something this rare and have the desire to own it that badly, right? Or you think that uh, Porsche might have, uh, as decoration, put those vinyls in uh, every one of those houses or some of them, the higher end? Yeah, could be. Maybe maybe it could be part of the, de- the deal, you know, like, hey, you buy the penthouse, you know, this kind of stuff is in it already. Who knows? I mean... Just 919 just sitting there and here's your vinyl to go with it. Yeah. It is, it is interesting. I mean, like I said, it goes back to what we talked about earlier, when, right when you think Porsche has like done everything they could possibly do and you never think they go, oh, what's, what's next for exclusivity? You know, they, they continue to surprise and wow us, which is amazing. That's why we love the brand so much. Yep. It's not a watch. It's not something we could think in. I mean, yeah. Uh, You're like, it's like, it's so off the wall. It's like, who thought of that? Like, but that's so cool. Yeah. I mean, the vinyl is definitely making a comeback, but I mean, to, to go, well, these tires, you know what? Let's celebrate with 24 different minutes of Le Mans. Yeah. And, and, you know, for us commoners like Aaron and I, and, and a lot of you that probably listen to the show, we're not left out. So the good thing is we're going to be able to listen to those 24 minutes, even though we can't own a piece of that record. Like you can find it on, you know, iTunes or Spotify and any of those kind of areas to listen to those 24 minutes. So you can at least hear what's on the record. So that's kind of cool of Porsche not shutting out the masses where they're just like, look, if you're not, if you're not buying it, you don't get to hear what's on it. Yeah, that's cool. I'm still, still leaving the fans there, but then if you're the, the ultra wealthy guy. Yeah, it goes back to being the elite, right? So yep. like anything in the world, like there's all levels of type of Porsche collectivity and groups. And I would say that people want to be a part of an exclusivity and limited numbers like, oh, there's only 3,000 of these things. There's only 6,000 of these things. And I want to be a part of that. And people are scratching and fighting to be a part of that group, you know, that, oh, well, there's only 3,000 of these and they're higher than these guys. And I want to be part of that 6,000, but yep. how do I get to that? And it's kind of like, it's, it's interesting, a little bit of tick for tack thing that gets created there. Exactly. As well, there's 3,000, but then there's this special model. Well, there's this special model with this extra option. Exactly. Oh, and I get X, Y, and Z when I become that kind of guy. Like, exactly. Or, or I get this and when I become that kind of guy, it's just, it's interesting. And, you know, I have zero hate against it. I, I actually like it a lot because it, it creates kind of a inner brand competitiveness between yep. each other. It so gives you, it gives you something else to shoot for too. On exactly, the brand. Right. Something to look forward to. It's something to, you know, it's, it's all in good fun. You know, you get to brag to your own buddies about it. It's not where you're being pretentious to somebody who doesn't know anything about Porsche. It's somebody who appreciates Porsche as a brand as well. And that's when you go ahead and, and throw that out there. Like, Oh, by the way, I have X, Y, and Z, or, Hey, I have this vinyl record. And you're saying this to another Porsche fan who's like, wow, that's really cool. And they can appreciate that. They're like, holy crap, that's awesome. Instead of them looking at you like, oh, you're a pretentious prick. Great. You have a vinyl album. Yeah. Nice. Great. Your vinyl album costs more than my house. You know, instead of them, you know, but you know, the masses that don't, don't get Porsche that have not been bitten by the bug. They don't get that. Right. Like instead of they look at the negative side of things instead of the positive side of things. Like we're, we're trying to be positive, obviously, you know, love everybody, regardless of whatever, you know, they want to do as long as it's Porsche, we love it. Yep. I mean, this falls into our, our collector. We're all collectors of, of stuff in the brand. That's yeah. how passionate we are. Great, great point. You know, like, and we had these conversations with some listeners right before, and, and we've had it with Drew and it's, and, and I've had these, and Aaron and I've had, and I have had these conversations where it's interesting because it's not just, if you're a Porsche guy, it goes deeper than just Porsche. It, it just goes, and, and what I mean, it's still within Porsche, but I mean, it's like decals, it's clothing, it's, oh, I have this many sweaters, I have this kind of Porsche hat that you can't buy, it can only be given out by the drivers, i.e. the Brumos hat that recently came out that everybody was kind of chasing after that wanted it on, and 
like just little things like that, because not only we love everything about Porsche so much that we've gone down that rabbit hole where we're like, I want that because that's exclusive and that's exclusive to Porsche. I want that because it's this, like all of us have run out of wall art, like places to hang wall art, I should say, not wall art itself, because there's never, there's an endless amount of that. Oh yeah. They know how to get the nail, they know how to produce, produce that yeah. very well. So I guess what we're getting at is like, it, it, we had this, you know, I know we're off on a little bit of a tangent here, but it is interesting to discover because we talked about this it, with one of our, our uh, friends, Jeff, it came out from San Francisco. Yeah. And uh, we had, he flew out for work unrelated to PCAR, but he reached out to us and said, hey, you know, I've never been to Tampa before. Do you guys have time to meet tonight? I'd love to just meet you in person and have a cocktail. And we met him down by the water in Tampa and we had a nice conversation. I mean, a couple hours when we just talked Porsche stuff, it was great. Yeah. And, and this conversation stemming from what we talked to him about was, it's just interesting over the years. And even if you're new to Porsche or you've been in Porsche for a long time, all the stuff you've accumulated over the years, because it says Porsche on it and you covet that name so much. Yeah. I mean, it really does. If it says it, then you, and you're at least intrigued to look at it and see, oh, you know, maybe, maybe I do want that. Or is there an older version of it? I mean, he was talking about the panoramas that he's, that he's found from like the fifties. Yeah. I mean, it's so, so early a lot of the the older stuff and just anything that has that brand name on it i think we feel a little bit of brainwashedness where we, i mean we love it so much it's it's at least entertained do yeah. i do i need that i mean could that go a place do i have a shelf for that somewhere yeah i think it's everything it, it all strikes a chord with us like we were i was throwing out a, a total random example at the restaurant we're at and this it wasn't at the restaurant but we i use this as an example i was like oh if you're walking to the restroom and you see something on the wall has like a Porsche crest hanging on the wall just as wall art in this random restaurant. It'll stop you in your tracks if you're a Porsche guy because you're like, what's that doing in here? That doesn't make any sense. I want to know the story behind it. I want to know everything about it. What's the history? Where'd this come from? Would this? And then the rain starts rolling just because that's how sick we are. Yeah. How old is it? <laughs> who got it? I wonder, who, I wonder who got this. Did the owner, does he like Porsche? Let's see. You know, it started, they started going down that uh, where, where? Yeah, the, yeah. The sickness is real and the sickness is deep. Like we get it. Trust us. That's why this is this podcast even exists because maybe this is a little bit of medicine for us and a little bit of therapy for you guys as well, because we all are coming together as a family to realize, Hey, we have this Porsche sickness. Yep. Gets the Porsche out. <laughs> we don't want it to go away. We're not trying to cure it. It's just healthy to talk about, right? <laughs> I'm Aaron and I have a Porsche problem. Yeah. Hi Aaron. How long have you had this problem? <laughs> all my life. <laughs> so true. But um, yeah, sorry we rambled a little bit there, but we just kind of wanted to talk about that because we found that to be very, very interesting and sharing that also with another a Porsche file like ourselves that, and, and, and kind of do a little self-reflection that what we were talking about, because I'm sure a lot of you guys out there listening have the same kind of disease that we have. Like, oh my God, I have so many Porsche t-shirts. I have so much Porsche keychain trinkets, like just kind of near, oh, I have all the matchbox cars. I have all this, I have that. I mean, you start thinking about it for a, set, for a minute and it's kind of like, not that it's a bad thing, it's a great thing, but it's just think about how passionate you are about the brand that it's stemmed that deep. Not only do you want to drive the car and own the car, you want to own everything else affiliated with that as well. Yeah, that is very true. So very, very interesting. Um, so we're going to take a quick break. Got a lot of stuff to go over still uh, when we come back, and we're going to go over some listener questions as well. All right, sounds good. Enjoying P-Car Talk? Of course you are. Connect with us on Instagram at pcartalk or on our website at pcartalk.com. If you're enjoying PCAR Talk, please subscribe and share this with anyone that would enjoy it as well. We thank you for your support. Now enjoy the rest of the show. All right, we're back from break, and we're going to go over some uh, listener questions here. We've got quite a few of them. We haven't gone over any listener questions in couple episodes so we kind of want to go over some of them because we love the engagement that you guys give us and like we said we want this to be a conversation with our with our viewer our listenership excuse me and uh aaron and i love engaging with you guys um you know via social media or you know when we see you guys in person so keep those questions coming um moving forward you know if you do want to ask questions always ask them at the Picard talk instagram page um that's where we're probably going to be best um, or at pcartalk.com, send us an email. Yep, that's the way to get to us. So get rolling, Aaron. What do we got? All right, first question. How important is OEM glass? Can I get away with a cheap Chinese windshield? Oh, man. Great question. Who's that from? That's from 
Adam Oda 14. Oh, our buddy Adam up in Chicago. Great question, Adam. So I'm going to go, I'll try to be not long winded. Going to Rolex 24. It's a downpour. My windshield is an original, it's, it's a 90. Um, so we're going, it's got some normal road debris chips on it, which is no problem, no big deal. So I get a pretty nasty chip where it kind of cracks a little bit in the glass on the way there because of the rain and what have you. I was pretty pissed off. I think I covered that already. But um, anyways, when we get there, my option was to fill it with resin because I wanted to keep that OEM glass as long as I could. And um, I'll continue to do that because I really don't want to get an aftermarket. Not because everything on my car is original, but it's just kind of one of the things. It's like that. That, one of those things left over and you're like let's try to let's preserve yeah, it it's the windshield's always been with the car and i mean barring some type of catastrophic failure or something i would love to have that of course we're not going to be able to find a, a 964 oem glass for me at this day and age i'm sure no i'm sure it's just laying around yeah probably just sitting in some warehouse somewhere well like we talked earlier some hoarder out there who's probably collecting everything there's probably some some nut bag who has all windshields from all every year, and he's probably charging a king's ransom for one, so I'm sure he has one out there for me, but you know, I'm not willing to pay 10 grand for one. Well, if you have one, just uh, contact Mike. I'm sure he wants a new windshield. <laughs> and I'll do. I'll have to do you disgusting favors that we could never talk about again, right? <laughs> well, so, I mean, so he was coming back from Rolex, and he got a chip in his, and then I go down to Miami, and I almost changed my windshield before going to Miami for DRT. Because it's been peppered, and I can see it when the sun hits it just right. Mm -hmm. And I had had a rock hit the windshield, but I was like, oh, I don't see anything. That must not have done anything. <laughs> so we're almost, we're heading back from DRT. And I was looking, and all of a sudden I looked down I looked far enough, and it's, it's right in the middle and kind of the lowest part of the windshield that it could be. And then there it is, oh. the biggest chip ever. Yeah, I saw that so, picture of that thing. That thing is wicked. Yeah, that's around. That's probably gonna get a Chinese windshield now. Yeah, I was thinking to myself, I go, man, and I didn't really have a lot to complain about after I saw your chip. <laughs> yeah, that was a giant rock. So I guess Aaron and I are both on the same page that uh, try to hang on to your OEM glass as long as you can. Stay away from the Chinese stuff there, Adam. I I definitely wouldn't want that. You know, that glass in my car if I could afford to get away with not having it there. But um, same thoughts with you on that one, Aaron. Yeah, I mean, it's like anything else. If you can go OEM, go OEM or OEM Plus if there's an option. Okay. Got a next question here. Um, I'll roll over this one pretty quick because it's pretty funny. Uh, Rob from the 964 page asks, he says, what are you boys wearing? Um, currently just wearing a t-shirt, no underwear, no socks, no nothing, just sitting here nude um, from the bottom half. But just looking professional, just in case there's any above waist pictures. That's how I'm rolling right now. <laughs> a little tuxedo t-shirt. Oh, man. But uh, nice question, Rob. Thanks. That's one of our lighthearted buddies from uh, the UK. I love glad, that question. Glad you're thinking it was Rob. Yeah. Aaron didn't say what he's wearing because he's not wearing anything. So. Well, it gives Mike something to look at. Yeah, he's just wearing a beard. <laughs> That's all I need. But uh, 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 next question from our buddy uh, Teddy uh, out in California, Formula 9XX. He's got a 964. He goes, talk about the 996. Lots of people think their values are going up. I, he goes, I don't think so. Parentheses, aside from the GT car or the turbo cars, it would be an interesting topic. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, just because all the, all the boats are rising, I don't know. But the 996, it's just, there's so much love that's not there for the car. But like we talked about before, that, that was the same thing for the 964. For a long time, mm -hmm. it was under underappreciated for what it was, and I mean, it's going to be a classic look. And I, I mean, it's I think it's starting to come into that classic look style. And I happened to see something from one of the guys in Chicago, I believe, that they were backdating nine nine sixes. Now, really, yeah. So it was backdating, and it looks the just hell, like that, that looks like, that work. <laughs> I, I'm not sure, and I, I I decided, well, you know, let me look that up and. There's nothing that I could find about seeing the back dates like he was showing me. So it must have been a friend mm. and kind of a one off thing. But yeah. it looked like a singer, but it was a 996. Really? Base, yeah. No, they do some research on that. That I could see if somebody was in the market to pick up some Jeep 996s and do yeah, that. Yeah, maybe they, a spinoff to like, you know, a company like kind of singer where they maybe take these cars and get in 
you know, at a cheaper rate, maybe take a, a base Carrera or, or something or a four S or, and then they start back dating them if that's yeah, I mean, a that's feasible an option. thing to do. I mean, cause you're going to get your, your future comforts out of that. Yeah. To see whether there's some type of purpose for that car. Um, I, it's hard to say because I, I think this topic has been discussed a lot and obviously in a lot of circles, Teddy. And I think that, I think you're onto something. I really feel like if these cars are going to be valuable, it's going to be a GT car, a 996 turbo. And I think it, it goes deeper than that too. It's not even just those cars. It's those cars and maybe even low mileage and a really good spec or a really good color too. Then those are going to probably carry some money. Yep. That's going to come down to the collector collectability of it. It's not going to, I don't think any of the base models or anything like that are really going to rise. I mean, yeah, like I saw, I saw a guy in New York. It had a PTS nine nine six Turbo S manual in Viper Green for sale, and I, I've never ever seen one for sale before in my life. No, let alone ever seen one in person or what have you. But it would, he was asking two hundred grand for the car. So, <laughs> to the certain buyer, maybe that car's worth two hundred grand. I mean, it's we're still kind of on the fence about the fried egg type of situation, but. Maybe 20, 30 years from now, you have a PTS 996 Turbo S in Viper Green. I don't know, man. That might be a, a Maybe. king. That might be a king. Who knows? You know, that, I mean, car, that car may still be 200 grand in 30 years. It may be 600 grand in 20, 20 years. Who knows? But I, I think if, if, if it's going to be, I kind of on the same page as what Teddy's thinking, if it's going to be valuable, I think it's going to either be a GT car or a turbo car, whichever variant you want, you know, GT2, you know, we can get into the depths of it. You know, there's all of those, but it's, you know, we'll just keep it at turbo and say blanket coverage, all of them. And I think if they're going to be valuable, I'm going to, it's going to go back to collectability. We're talking about valuable. So we're going to unfortunately talk about mileage. So I think the cars are going to have to be lower miles and they're going to have to be good specs. Yep. I mean, that's, I agree with, with all those things. I, I, there's not, um, Mar- I mean, they, was, they made so many 996s. Mm-hmm. And it's not like they only made Purdue's 2000 for one year. Yeah, they made a gazillion of them. Yeah. So I, I think at the end of the day, I think the what I want to say is if you're present now and you can own one of those cars, drive the hell out of it. Like, don't yeah, just drive it. Don't hope to make, you know, sit there and make your car valuable. I mean, at, at any level, you know, not even 996, just drive the hell out of the car because that, that's the reason why you bought the car is because that's a driver car. If you want to sit there and talk about collectability and low mileage and certain specs and all that kind of stuff. I feel like you're in the wrong game. You know, you probably need to be a Ferrari guy or a Lambo guy at that point. Or at least not in the 996 realm. Yeah, right. So so that answers that question. Um, what, what do we have next here, Aaron? All right, from the Cayman district, what are our thoughts on the Caymans? And what are our thoughts on the wide body craze? Mm, do you want to lead with this or you want me to go ahead and go? Uh, you can go. Well, I like Caymans a lot. Um, Maybe someday I may own one, but it's not in my immediate future to own one of those cars. I do like them a lot. I think they're very cool cars. I like the ethos behind that vehicle. Um, they're very, very nimble, and that's what Porsche is supposed to be. Um, I feel, you know, we, we've talked about it before. The 992's grown a lot, you know, as far as 911's go. So I, I really feel that Cayman kind of fills that gap now where... Porsche maybe he's gotten really kind of bloated and if you still want a nimble car it's still athletic and still does a lot of things it came in as your car I think or unless you want to go early 911 um my thoughts on the wide body craze you know I'm not a I'm kind of like even keel I'm on the I'm on the fence about it to be honest with you because I don't have any hatred to, for it but I don't have a strong desire to own something that's been wide body so I guess my best description of how I feel about them is it's kind of right in the middle. Like I like them. They're aesthetically when I see them, I, I think they're cool. But as far as me wanting to own one, I have some reluctancy behind that. So, and maybe because I know what it takes to make it look that way, you know, and, and I'm, I'm referring to maybe more of kind of an RWB setup where fenders need to be caught or, 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 or not even RWB. Like if you want to, if you want to backdate a car and you have a, a narrow body car and you want to put turbo flares on it and you got to butt up, what, you know, butt weld some stuff and chop the car up to do that. Um, I kind of have a, you know, earlier in my career, I have a little bit of a medical background and Aaron already knows, and he's talked about it before where I have a feeling towards these cars, like these cars have personalities. So we're sitting there chopping them up and we're doing this and, you know, maybe the car wants that and maybe it doesn't and it's all up to the owner, but 
again, I, I guess the best answer I feel about that is I'm just kind of middle of the ground. Like I'm, if you, if that's kind of the car that you desire and you actually have one of those, I'm not going to hate it because it's your car. But I just, for me personally, I don't know if I'd go down that path. I'm not saying I'll never will. So I don't get, I ever get flamed if I own one in 10 years. So I'm protecting myself on that side, but I like them enough to where they're, I think they're aesthetically pleasing. I see pictures of them and some look better than others. And I think it goes back to, um, whoever developed the car, meaning like whoever built the car, like you can see some kind of wonky ones and it goes back to stance, you know, that the right, right, right height for the car, you know, the right tire gap and the right setup. So there's more than just wide body in the car, right? There's like, there's suspension, there's everything that goes into it. So you got to make it look right. So I know that was kind of long winded, but that's, I'm in the middle of the ground. How about you, Aaron? Yeah. I mean, I like them. And I think as far as wide bodies go, the, what, what instantly came to mind was the roof. And if they're using it as a base, to to build their cars off of their CTR cars, then you know it's a good platform. Outstanding point, right? How do you feel about Caymans? <laughs> you went straight to white. Oh no, I, no, I said I like them. I like them. Yeah. I, I Would like you ever them. own one? I don't know. I mean, I don't anything's know. possible, right? That is true. I mean, I probably would own one just for just for the fact to feel that that uh, mid engine versus the rear engine, which I'm sure that's a balance that's that's going to be better. Yeah. Somewhat. Yeah, I kind of agree with that. So the next question, I guess it's, um, how do you even say that name? Drewski Stanley? Dr. Kyle Stanley. Oh, is that what he's going with? Dr. Kyle Stanley? He's asking about, what's the best looking vintage lightweight seats for an air-cooled car? Oof. I haven't been shopping for vintage seats for for an air-cooled car, so (laughs) So I might have to defer to Mike on this. I'm going to say like early Recaro buckets, probably like the ones that came standard on the RSR cars. Um, I know they're pretty narrow, so you have to be kind of a slender guy to fit in those kind of seats. But um, (laughs) to go off on another tangent, I actually kind of think it's a great idea for maybe if you get in that seat and it's kind of snug for you, maybe that's kind of a, hey, you know. Maybe you should go some driver's training yeah, or maybe, something. Maybe you know, I, okay, some, some not only am gym. I going to get my car in shape, maybe I should get myself in shape a little bit. And I'm not saying anything about that, but those cars, that's a narrow seat. You just had me thinking when you were personifying the car, I was just thinking the car's going, man, I wish this guy would go to the gym. <laughs> or the car's like, hey, man, I'm lightweight. Why can't you be lightweight? <laughs> exactly. how, how, do you, how can you get there? Yeah, right. It's like, hey, I'm a lightweight guy, and you know, we would go a lot faster maybe if you cut a little bit of weight here. And I'm trying to get there, but uh, you're not helping, dude. Yeah. So I would say early Ricardo buckets there, Doc, on that one. Um, he's got another another question here, doesn't he, Aaron? Yep. So he said, um, I think someone something cool to discuss would be to expose the hook behind the seats of the water cooled cars for all the moms and dads. Uh, he said he's, he's read a, had to read a lot of forums to, to figure that out. I guess he was referring to the, uh, for the, the, the uh, hanger. It looks like the, the hook behind it, just a, uh, like a suit hanger or a blazer hanger. Mm-hmm. That's what it's for. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty standard on that because they assume anybody who's in a Porsche um, needs to probably have a blazer or some type of suit thing, you know, at some point, or maybe even a dress shirt or button down shirt. So that's what that's for. I really wish I had one in the 964 because when I we go to these events, I'm just kind of laying my blazer on the seat next to me, and it's really not any. I guess I could drape it along the half cage in the back, couldn't I? <laughs> well, yeah, you now have scaffolding back yeah. there. <laughs> As we're cruising down the road, and it's kind of flapping in there, looking like a total douche. Yeah, keep it wrinkle free. Yeah, air dry it, right? Air dry it. But um, yeah, that's that's interesting, and that's what's for. Um, here's another question he's had, uh, Doc had too as well. He said, "Is what's the highest mileage nine nine seven point two nine eleven you ever seen?" I'm asking because I'm planning to keep my nine nine seven point two forever, and wondering at what mileage do these engines need to be rebuilt? That's a great dual question there. I don't know what the I. Uh, I mean, I know it's been over probably over a hundred thousand miles. I mean, my dot one has over a hundred thousand miles. I don't know what I've never. The highest dot two I've ever seen was like around one forty, oh. and I was on and the engine hadn't been rebuilt yet, and nothing else was giving inclination that it needed to be rebuilt. Um, it still ran. It didn't fail down on power. I mean, if if you ha- if you had covered up the odometer, I would have never guessed it had that kind of mileage on it on the car. It, it aged very very well. 
No, I mean, it's a good question for the rebuilds. I haven't heard a lot of people talking about rebuilds for those cars with the dot twos. I mean, because they're still relatively newish. So I I would say two to be determined on that one, Doc, because I I, I was in one with 140, but I don't know enough about where that that engine's going to let loose or something. Maybe probably start, you know, worrying about getting an engine rebuild or from where, but. I would say the good thing about those cars is a lot of people, depending on what model you had, have been driving the piss out of them, you know? So that, that's true. They always say a, a running engine is a good engine. So that's not leaking oil. You're, you're doing something right. Exactly. So long as you, you know, you're running on a regular basis and you, it keeps doing daily duty, you know, that, I, that should be good. As far as, you know, comparing it to other cars, I mean, there's, you know, what, 700,000 mile, Aaron and I were talking about a, a, yeah. a G-body car that had 700,000 miles. Obviously, it's probably at a rebuild, but chassis-wise, yeah. chassis yeah. we're talking 700,000 miles. What is that, 930 done a million miles, the one guy in Canada? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, So, I mean, obviously, there's been, I think, the there's been a top-end rebuild. I actually think they've never cracked the case on that car, believe it or not, on that yeah. 930. I think it's just had a lot of top-end rebuilds and maybe turbo replacements, so... Like anything, Doc, I think if it's maintained properly and it gets what it needs, it's going to live a long, long time. Like you change oil on a regular basis, you take care of it, 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 and it never wants for anything. I think, and anytime it does need something and you replace whatever faulty part has gone bad, I think that it's going to treat you good for a long, long time. Yep, just good maintenance. Yeah, I mean, I've seen G-body cars where they're like standards, like, oh, well, you got to rebuild the engine at 90. I've seen cars go like 200 plus without a rebuild just because it's been meticulously maintained, like constant oil changes, you know, proper warm-up times where people aren't beating on it when it's cold, and it, the car runs great. So I just, I guess it's really just depending on, uh, up to the operator on that one. What else do we have here? Let's see, uh, one from... DVS Melser. So, what do we think about backdating a 993, 993 with a ducktail? Yes or no. 993 with tartan or houndstooth? Yes or no. 993 with Fuchs style wheels? Yes or no. I'm guessing this gentleman has a 993. Uh, I would imagine he might. <laughs> Great car. Um, so, I'll go, I'll start. 993 with ducktail? Yes. Uh, 993 with tartan or houndstooth? Yes to both. <laughs> so, it works for both. Um, 993 with Fuchs style oil, yes or no? I'm going to say no on that one. Yeah, I would say no after seeing Patrick's with mm-hmm. those. Are they speed lines or what, what were Patrick's? He has speed line classics on his yeah, car. Yeah, so after seeing, I was not even really that big of a fan of the 993s, but mm-hmm. seeing his in black with the white meatball, the speed lines, man, that, yeah. oh, that I would good. even say a BBS E88 wheel is, That's money, always the goal. Yeah, is a money on a 993. I think if, if you ever in question for a wheel and you don't want to go like standard OEM wheel, I think my highly highly second choice is going to be a 993 e88 bbs wheel like it just looks so choice on an on on a 993 and a 964 but i mean it looks really good on a 993 as well porsche across the board when it starts looking more race car that's when it starts getting better yeah that's always a w for me at least it's so if the more motorsport it can look like and less like dentist office i'm good like if it looks (laughs) the business i'm i'm all about it yeah i mean so for me to answer the questions ducktail always uh, tartan or houndstooth? I'm a, I'll probably more tartan. I'm on the tartan side. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, the, I like the wheels we already talked about. I, I'm good with the E88 or, or doing some speed lines. Yeah. And then let's address the big one. The first one he asked, backdating. So a backdating a 993, you know, I, I don't know if I've ever seen one in person other than pictures on the internet, a 993 being debackdated. If I had, I didn't notice I did. Yeah, I I think everybody's kind of keeping them because they're of that last air cooled air elk. Mm-hmm. Nobody's really wanting to touch them yet, I guess. Yeah, and and then maybe if you have a basket case, you can go back date one. So, you know, I, I would say if you have one to do it and you're bold enough, go for it. I I like people that are bold with stuff. I I don't you know don't follow conformity. If they, if it's your car and you're asking these questions because you want to do this to your car. I say go nuts, man. Who gives a damn what anybody else thinks? Yep, make it your car. Yeah. If, if you really want to backdate that, that car because you want the, the feel and the comfortability, but you like the old school car where you're going to resto it and you want like all those like old school touches, I'd say go for it because, you know, you only go around once and why not? Like 
everybody's going to love you. I think the Porsche community has changed a lot over the years. And we kind of talked about this as far as acceptance. Um, a lot of people were always saying you need to have something stock or keep it stock ride height. I think there's room for everybody nowadays, regardless of what you want to do. I mean, look at how you can go from mild to wild. We have RWB guys. They were all at that event at DRT. Yep. They were being welcomed just as much as the guys running the 356 cars that were bone stock. So it's, I think the family has either meshed very well over the last few years, either because they've had to, because some people are aging and they still want to be included, and either they know that the regime is changing over, or maybe just people are getting nicer. I don't yep. really know what That's, it is. I would say it's more of a it's more of a modern family where it's very much all inclusive because it's keeping everybody realizes that it's that love of Porsche that unites everybody. Not yeah, you don't have to love what somebody else did to theirs. It's the overall portion. Yeah, they yeah, have. They have, Yeah, they have the DNA. The, the DNA for it, right? Like they're they're there. They get it. Like they're a Porsche guy, and just because they didn't do what you wanted to do, there's no hate there. I, I, at least that's how we try to approach everything, and that's why we want to. In our family of P Car Talk family, we want people to always just love what everybody else is doing. You know, regardless of whether you're on the same page of them as not. The nice thing is, is this. It is nice to see different things and different ideas, and you know the what everybody's trying to do and bring something different to the table that can maybe give you an idea to maybe what you want to build something. Someday. Exactly. Maybe you thought about it and then that person did it and you're like, well, I don't know about that now. Yeah. There's some things that the DRT that I saw that I was like, Oh, I'm going to do this. And then the, the almost the exact same bill for the 997 was there. And I was like, well, you know what? Maybe I'm not going to run those wheels because I don't like that as much as I thought. And that's, it's always helpful for somebody Yeah, to get an idea. Like you said, I agree. Um, so moving forward, we have some more questions here. Um, this one's pretty, it's more bullet point form. It says doing car things. It says back dates discuss. Hmm. It's kind of wide open. I mean, we could have a whole show on that. So I'm just going to go with like, maybe how does, how do we feel about back dates? I like them. I, I, I like any, and it goes back to like, we were already discussing this already. Like, why do, why do we like them? I like everything. So I just like to see different things. And I know everybody's like, oh, well, there's so many backdates and there's so many this out there. And honestly, and this is just my personal opinion, everybody kind of thinks there's a lot of backdates out there just because they access to social media now and people are posting a lot of pictures. But like, if you go to Porsche events, there's only a handful of backdates probably there at any given time at any given event. So when you're seeing them in person, I almost kind of feel it goes back to that GT3 moniker or GT3 RS moniker where they're like, oh my God, they're everywhere. Well, they're all everywhere all over social media, but when you go to an event, maybe you're seeing a handful of them. So yeah, that's true. Except for that, uh, <laughs> the what is it? The were they GT2 RSs that that were at that event for the protective film thing? There was 14 of them. Yeah, uh, I think that was the new hot car at the time. So I think that was just that had a lot to do with that. So. And then that his second question is, why so many greens? So I guess he's maybe asking why are there so many shades of green within Porsche? Uh, that's called ind- individuality. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about that, Aaron? Do you feel there's too many greens? Do you feel like there's... No. I mean, uh, there, <laughs> there's, not an, I'm, there's not enough because there'd be something I, I've seen. I'm like, oh, I think that shape would look good. And I mean, whether it's birch, lizard. Oh, I mean, there's a ton yeah. of them. But I mean, it's all, it all comes down to... Yeah, there are a million GT2 RSs and GT3 RSs, and if I want that car, like everybody wants, or any of those other cars now that I can get in a PTS, mm-hmm. I don't want the same lizard green that you have, and I'm a fan of green, I'll, yeah. I'll pick something, I'll search through, search through sit up or something. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's great to have different diversity. Yeah, I agree. And why so many greens? I, I agree with that as well, and not just to be agreeable with Aaron, but I, I like everything. I mean, why so many blues? You could ask that many questions there too. Why are there so many different shades of blue? Um, I like all the different colors, to be honest with you. Being, I mean, us being the type of guys that we are, we just like everything about having colorful type of vehicles. I mean, I think for a long, long time, unfortunately, there was such a stereotype about having a bright color or they're like, oh, well, you're being pretentious. You're trying to show off. You're trying to get attention and that's not what Porsche is about. And you should get silver, black or white or red and just get something from the very, very basic color wheel. And I kind of disagree with that, like that, that idea and that ethos behind that. I'm not saying that I don't like those colors, but I don't like the idea of like, if you are spending the kind of dollar that you're spending, you should be able to buy whatever you want to buy. 
regardless of what anybody else is trying to influence you to buy, if you are a guy who like really likes ruby steel and red, and people are like, you don't want a pink car, man. Why are you buying a pink car? Don't buy that. That's not manly. That's not masculine. If you like the car, who gives a damn what anybody else says? You're driving the car every day. You're going to look at the car, man. Yep, it's the color that you like. Yeah, don't, so. don't let the salesman talk you into buying an anthracite gray because it's going to have great resale value someday. Are you going to be happy driving that car? If you are, then, then you should buy that color. But if it's not, who gives a damn? Yep, he's not the one selling it. Yeah. So, I agree. Have as many greens as you can have. All the greens. What else do we have here? We got, uh, so Weekend, Weekender Porsche has, uh, what's our take on chipping an air-cooled car? Have we done it? Issues? And were there any improvements that you noticed? Should I lead with this one? Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're gonna, I haven't chipped one recently. All right, so Weekender, yeah, my car is chipped. It has a Steve Wong tune on mine. Um, any issues? None. I've been on the car for almost four years now. Noticeable improvements? Yes. Um, throttle response is very quick. Everything about the car runs smoother. Um, I'm sure if you haven't, I see that your profile picture is a 964. Uh, there's a little bit of a stumble down low on a factory 964. I don't know if you guys that have a 964 know that. If you're ginger with the throttle, it may fall flat on its face and actually may stall out. Um, it kind of takes that out of it. Um, so yes, yes, and yes, I would say on that vehicle, if you're going to chip one, Steve, and, and on top of Steve, I can, I can talk to you a little bit about him as a person. He's a great guy. You can call him Monday through Friday. And if you're having an issue with a chip that you bought, or you just have questions, he spends the time and talks to you on the phone, which is pretty rare nowadays. You can actually reach him. Well, that's crazy. So it speaks a lot about who he is as a person and what he's providing as a product. And if, if there's any other issue with that, he'll send you, he'll overnight you another chip and you can send that one back. So the customer service there is paramount. And, um, I love the way my cars ran with it. Uh, what, ever since I've had it in it, it's, it's been a different animal ever since I put it in the car. Man, his car's quick. So yeah, I, I say it helps a lot. It cleans a lot of that up. Um, the power becomes very linear, which I'm sure all of us enjoy, especially if you like to go out for a drive. Um, so yeah, so do it if you haven't done it. Um, looks like we have yeah, one more from JG underscore four, four, seven, three. Kick it off. Tell me what he's saying. Uh, he's talking about, uh, horsepower and torque mods. What's impactful. What's a waste of money. What's for a, a, an everyday mod. What would be for track and what won't break the bank for both air and water cold. That's a, that's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of question. Wow. Okay. So since you're, since you have a water cooled car, I'll let you lead with this and then um, we'll try to, we'll try to just keep it, you know. We won't blow it all the way out of proportion because this could be a whole episode on its own. So we'll try to just cover the the highlights on this. I think for me, just uh, the, the biggest or the easiest thing would be just an exhaust to hear it a little bit more because they're super quiet from the factory. Mm -hmm. um, the muffler bypass that I did with uh, this whole performance stuff, it's loud, but it's not crazy loud. So it's just still tolerable no matter what you say. Yeah, how is deletes. it when you're cruising down the road? How is cabin noise? Is there any drone or anything like um, that? I have cabin noises, but just because I have solid motor mounts. Okay. I think that's the only reason I really have anything. But when it's in sixth, mm -hmm. it's fine. It's barely, it's tolerable. Nobody even knows. And you get on it, it's, it's loud. But otherwise, I don't really feel like it drones too bad at all. So it's good for daily use, not just like... Yeah, I think, it's, I think it'd be perfectly acceptable because it gives you that nice little rumble. It, gives you, it lets you know it's there, but it's not, mm -hmm. it's not race car loud. Okay. I mean, as far as other things, I mean, I really don't know that tunes do too much. I'll, I'll tell you that in the future. I'm supposed to, I'm going to get a, a tune from a, a friend and I'll, I'll give you some updates on that once, the, once that happens. Um, anything else as far, I mean, if it's not a turbo car, you're really not, it's going to take a lot to start before you start seeing tons of power yeah that na motor is pretty stout from the factory they've they've maximized a lot uh out of that motor as far as like they haven't left a whole lot on the table for you to scavenge there no it's just it's just weight it's it's w taking weight out it's going to be the, your best really your most performance bet mm -hmm. out of the car yeah i kind of agree with that even i don't have a water cold i kind of know a lot about it and to touch on a little bit what do you agree for, with for the track i, I mean if you're gonna if you're gonna track a water cool car obviously it's going to live on the track you don't need to meet emissions i mean straight pipe the damn thing yep no yeah don't worry about cats yeah. um free flow it uh, yep and then 
obviously coilovers. And if you're going to do coilovers, a KW setup is just fine for the track. Because mm-hmm. that car sounds wicked straight piped. Oh, yeah. And so. then uh, some of those E88s that we mentioned, that, that'd be a wheel yeah. that I would probably choose if you're yeah. going to track it, that type of thing. Spend some good money on tires. It's definitely all of that stuff. And I would say from as from a mod standpoint, you know, I know it's kind of a redundant topic, so I won't go into it too deep. But if you're going to spend time on the track, you should definitely go to like a, a Bonnerot school or go to one of these schools and learn how to properly hit the apex and like drive your car properly. I think that's going to shave a lot of time if you're going to be a track rat. Yeah. And D events, just like anything, anything you can find mm-hmm. local and that type of thing. Yeah, that works. Yeah. From an air cooled perspective, like we kind of covered a little bit with Weekender, you know, it's. You can go and get a Steve Wong chip, maybe do a little bit of headers, do some exhaust work, maybe cams. When, but after that, you're really taking the slippery slope. You know, if we're talking like deep old school air air cools, we can do like PMO carbs. We can go, we we can get nasty. You can start stroking a motor. You can get a lot out of that car. You can twin spark it. But I mean, we're talking twenty, thirty thousand dollars at that point. So you know, and he discussed like what's what's worth it from a waste of time and money and type of situation. I don't believe there's a such thing as with an early car. If you go down that path, I know it sounds incredibly expensive and you're not getting a ton of power, but I think there's enough power where you start balancing the chassis. I mean, if you're talking about an early, early car, like a 2,400 pound air cool car and you put PMO carbs and you twin spark it and you stroke the motor and you're, you're pushing 300 to the wheel. I mean, that car is 2,400 pounds with 300 horsepower to the wheel. Yeah, that's that power to rate that's, is really well. That's a firecracker, man. And I mean, that is moving and it's, it's nimble as all get out. It's light. It doesn't have a lot of, you know, parasitic weight carrying around. So as far as a waste of money, I can't, I, I, I'm not in the camp of saying that's a waste of money. I can be in the camp of saying it is very expensive to do that. Yeah, I would say it wouldn't be a waste of money, but it's just a it's a dependent on the uh Yeah, how big's your bank account? Yeah, how right? big is the pockets? Yeah, how big's your bank account at that point? So if you have if you have deep pockets and you want to build a nasty build, you know, that that's a great car for you. Um so on that note, I think we got one more question and we'll close it out. Um Adam um in Chicago had one more question. He goes, Do you feel like the N spec uh tire is a lot of nonsense? Sorry for the leading question. Um, flat sixes had just had a post on it. I had some thoughts about it because I talked to a Bridgestone rep. Um, so what do you, what are your thoughts on that, Aaron, as far as an end spec tire? Uh, I mean, uh, and for everybody else, that's, that's basically a cut tire. Yeah. So, I mean, I, it, it's one of those things like if it exists, it exists for a reason they've tested it. It's, it's an improvement Mm -hmm. over something. So it wouldn't exist if it if it didn't need to be there yeah i feel like it's one of those things where it isn't witchcraft where people say like it's oh well this is the greatest and it doesn't perform because there's a clear distinction of like obviously the car performs a lot well uh a lot well a lot better on track with the inspect tire um with that cup tire so in the main thing it's like anything you got to get them hot right the conditions yep. have to be right so essentially you're running a drag slick on a car on a track um and I think maybe he's referring to is does, you know, Porsche requires you if you, if you have a newer car, maybe it came with that tire that that tire has to go back on that car. Um, do I agree with that? Not necessarily when we go down with that path, you know, if you're, if you're a guy who has a GT three, you don't need to run cup twos on the car on the street all the time. If <laughs> there's, yeah, if it rains, yeah, have fun. Exactly. So if, if, if it's doing a lot of street duty, you don't have to have a cup two on the car. There's a lot of other options from Michelin that makes a wonderful tire where it's a streetable tire where they get, you know, where they get hot, you know, you can run the PS fours or something like that. If you want to run something like that on the street. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. The PS fours are probably, I mean, a good everyday tire. Cause I mean, there's, there's gotta be people out there that are, that are daily. Of course. Cars. I mean, there's, I've seen tons of stuff on social media where people are daily driving their GT threes to work at live in areas that have great roads. and you know, I've heard many guys that say, well, I only have an eight mile commute and the road that I drive to work is beautiful. And the weather where I live at is beautiful most of the time and the traffic isn't bad. So guess what I do? I drive my brand new GT3 to work every day and I drive it home every day. Good for you for taking that eight mile blast in that car. That would be, that would be addictive. I would definitely want to do something like that. Yeah. I'd find it and a little extra eight miles just to, oh, I need, I need exactly. to get some, some more out of it. Unfortunately, we live in a land of traffic, so that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for us. So that's true. Um, 
but yeah, I think that's about all the questions we have um, or able to get to, I should say. There are probably a few more still out there on the table that I haven't gotten to. Do you see any, Aaron, that you want to address? I think we're good for now. I mean, that was, that was a, it's quite a bit. Yeah. And again, guys, we appreciate the feedback. If you want to ask any questions, please visit those sites that we discussed prior to going over those questions. Um, we love hearing from you guys, love going over that stuff. Um, we had a pretty good episode here. Anything else you want to cover, Aaron, before we close up? I think we're good. All right, guys. Well, again, thank you guys so much for tuning in and listening to us and supporting us uh, internationally and nationally. We love you guys, and uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Yep, see ya. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of PCAR Talk. Connect with us on Instagram at PCAR Talk or online at PCARTalk.com.